thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me out. I was thinking about our interpreters. Good thing it's not a democratic thing. I don't know how you interpret double talk. <laughs> that would be uh, a challenge for them in the democratic function. So, um, I did want to say, and first I want to shout out to, to my colleagues. Uh, Joe Druders uh, is my roommate up there, one of the best uh, leaders we've had in the Republican Party of Florida. You know, people say when you're uh, when you're my age, you have roommates. Well, they pay us about twenty-eight thousand dollars a year, so that's why we have to have roommates when we get up there. Um, but Dennis Baxley, uh, if you think about this, one of the most controversial bills. It shouldn't be controversial. We we shouldn't even have to file a bill on parental rights. You would think that that would not be something we have to do. We had to do that. But you have two. You have Dennis Baxley uh, and Joe Hardy from a black yeah. very proud. And, and they're worth a fight. And, and certainly Governor DeSantis has been a leader on these things, but let me tell you what, uh, he signs the bill, takes free court. If you watch some of the committee hearings, if you watch the debate on the floor, the questions that are gone for hours and hours to, to Representative Hardy and Senator Baxley, uh, and they're not designed or enlisted to, to gain knowledge. They're, what they do is the Democrats try to trip them up, try to make them look bad. And, and it's a brutal thing to take all the, the heat that they did they had protesters outside of the chamber. They had protesters outside of a, uh, down in the old Capitol. And, uh, but you've got two guys right here, in the representative senator, that took the fight. And they were the ones that were the leading this charge. Governor, we great governor. He signed these. But these guys are the ones that fought that fight. Um, and again, why do we have to do that? I mean, if you think about that. Um, and have you all seen some of the posters, the gender bearer or whatever they have, teddy bears that, that are non-binary? Uh, that they're showing to kids. Um, and this is like, this is a, a losing issue for them, like that Dennis that I've ever said on the polling. Matter of fact, I have a guy came in Gainesville. Um, my wife keeps saying we're going to move to Ocala. Uh, soon you get out of Gainesville. Um, but I had a guy come to me and he's running against the chair of the county commission and he's a Republican. And if you're in Alachua County being a Republican, we've had two Republicans since Reconstruction. And they were both one-termers who got voted out. But I told him, I see some of my black friends here in the community, thank you for your stance, what you've taken up. I know it's a battle, but we're seeing a shift in that in the, in the other communities, in the Hispanic communities, in the black communities. I told that guy, I said, you wanna, you wanna win? I said, it's gonna be very tough. I said, I would print a whole bunch of brochures up that said the commissioner that you're running against uh, wants kindergartners, first graders, to be taught that they're non-binary, that they can change their gender. This is for kindergartners and first graders it's an insane world, but we fought that fight. But I told him, I think that they overplayed their hand. I think Disney overplayed their hand. And I think this is a moment that we can seize and have conservative people in the minority party that are going to come to our side. And it's not just the minority party. There's a lot of independents out there that are fed up and frustrated with this issue and all. I will tell you, just on that bill, that uh, one of the things that I try to do, I live in Gainesville again. Uh, it's not a bastion of conservatism. Uh, it's really, we call it the San Francisco of the East. Uh, and so what, but, but my goal and my role, and I think one of the most important roles that I have, is to engage especially young people and challenge them. But I do that in a different way. This is where I'd encourage you to do this. I went out, this is funny, we had the protesters outside of the chamber, and uh, they were yelling and screaming. And the sergeant's office, they always try to protect us. And so they come to us and say, hey, they got protesters. And we got back entrances into the chamber. Uh, I go down to the third floor. I walk all the way across the house. I come up there on the fourth floor. And I walk right through all the protesters. Uh, and then I get to my end and I stand for a while. And someone comes over to me and engages me. And finds out that I'm a state senator. And I group them around me. And, um, and they were really yelling at me. It's funny. They go, you're going to vote this bill down. And I was like, well, what, what bill are you talking about? You know the bill, don't say gay bill. And I went, the don't say gay bill. And I was being sincere, I was trying to be sincere, and saying, uh, don't say gay bill. I haven't seen that bill, and I'm pretty sure I know all the bills that are coming up in the debate. Uh, a couple of them get really upset quickly. But uh, another one's engaged me, and we start talking about it. I made them pull the bill up on their phone. I said, let's pull it up and talk about it and read it. I had two young ladies that were so in, engaging and, and happy and, and that I would engage them and then, and they're reading it. Mm -hmm. But what we can't do is we cannot take a group of, especially young people like that, that are being indoctrinated in some areas and just try to 
bash them and say, you're wrong, you don't know what you're doing. You engage them as I want to learn, I want to understand. And if you do that, um, you'll find that when they, first they, they don't necessarily know what they're talking about, like this group did not know. Uh, this bill, the House bill, the, the uh, Senate bill that this file was, was four pages. If you got amended, it was seven pages. You can read the whole thing in, in a couple of minutes, the whole bill. And that's what I have those students do. So we won that battle. I think uh, Disney showed its hand. How can you have the executive of the, one of the largest corporations in the United States, who apparently, he hasn't read the bill, um, or doesn't care to, and he doesn't care to stand up for his conservative workers, but he cowpows to the, the vocal minority out there. But obviously that guy didn't read the bill either. Because like I say, don't say gay bill. But they were overplaying their hand because when people do read the bill, when people understand the bill, normal people are not gonna oppose that. Normal people are gonna propose, uh, oppose equality in Florida and they're trying what they're trying to do, what they're trying to do in the school system. And it's not just this, this is just one of the overt things that they're trying to do. Um, I've shared this with some of you. There's a book that my uh, father came to me in Gainesville. I've never met him. He was a little, he didn't really know he wanted to engage me, but I called up and said, I got to talk to you about a class at the, at the middle school in Gainesville. And so I said, come on. And he obviously didn't know my background. Otherwise, he'd have uh, not been so worried about what I was going to think about this. But he had a bill, and, and this is what's where they're a little bit conniving. This is not a history book. This was a vocabulary book. This is in cur curriculum in Gainesville. I don't know what y'all have in Ocala. You're hoping it's not, but you really never know until, until parents get involved. So he somehow got a hold of this book. This book is about changing the Constitution. And if you read it, the very first thing it talks about, it shows people protesting across the river. It's a vocabulary book. And it talks about changing the Constitution and the way they word it, the way it encourages 10-year-old kids to talk about the Constitution is the Constitution needs to be changed. The Constitution is ever-evolving, and the Constitution needs to change. And it gives them ideas, but it doesn't do it uh, overtly. It does it covertly with 10-year-old kids on how they can go about and change the Constitution uh, for social change. And that's the whole thing with Stacey Abrams. A whole page, and it talks about disenfranchisement, and it uses the word of oppression and disenfranchisement. In other words, and they're in blue, and it has a little paragraph over here as you're reading the article. It says, make sure you pay attention to the students of the words in blue. Those are your vocabulary words. Oppression. I want to take a copy. I want to take a copy and just take out Stacey Abrams and put Donald Trump in there, take it to the school board and get Latchel County and say, <laughs> would y'all ever think about Donald Trump being in a, in a curriculum talking about elections? Of course. They wouldn't, but they're doing this, and this is in a vocabulary book in a Latchwood County. And you're not aware of it, you don't know what's going on, they're gonna teach our kids this. Plato said, Plato said the two most important things on earth, the two most important things on earth are who's teaching your kids and what are they teaching? Right, right. The next generation. Right. And I won't spend a long time listening to it. I know we wanna have some time for, for some questions, but I wanna talk about education and what we're talking about. I used to have a book it was called um, A Godless Constitution, A Moral Defense of a Secular State. It was written by two professors from Cornell University. Now this is one of the most prestigious universities in the world, has two professors write a history book, and this, is for, this isn't for 10 year olds, this is for college kids. A, a Godless Constitution, A Moral Defense of a Secular State. And if you read through the book, I ordered one. I didn't want to pay any money, but I had to get it because I wanted to have it make sure and, and read it and understand it. And, and it's a history book that talks about the founding of our country. And it's all revisionist history. None of it's accurate, none of it's right. As a matter of fact, what I find is uh, pretty incredible in this history book, history book, is if you go to the back page, in a history book, you have footnotes, right? They. I'll paraphrase if I remember the exact words. They talk about, in the footnote section, they say, due to the content of this book and its knowledge of historians and political scientists, we have dispensed with the usual scholarly apparatus of footnotes. <laughs> However, we have included notes from other political scientists and history professors. So what they've done, they've written a history book about the United States and our foundation, and they haven't quoted any founding fathers. They haven't quoted any founding documents. They quoted their contemporaries, other professors in their period. That's being taught to our kids in colleges, at the University of Florida and other universities around the, the nation. And so it's incumbent upon us 
to find out what our kids and what our grandkids are learning. And it's up to, and if you think about this, I, I talked to a group, this is a while ago, I talked to a group of, uh, uh, it was a Jewish group at the University of Florida. So a lot of retired professors, and uh, one of the guys was the dean of the, dean emeritus of the School of Journalism. And as we're going along the conversation, it's kind of a, he's moderating a little bit, we're talking about different things. I bring up uh, the separation of church and state. And, uh, but in a little twist. And he goes, uh, hey, I, 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 I'll let you go on and on, but I think I need to stop you right there because, you know, we've had a constitution separation of church and state for about 235 years, whatever it was. It's worked pretty well. And I said, oh, really? I said, you know, right, separation of church and state, what does that mean? And how, and how was that interpreted by our founding fathers? And what was their intent of that? And if you go back and study, and if you read our founding fathers, and you understand where they got our constitution, if you got where they got our form of government, <coughs> it all comes from mostly either common law, that's English law, but most of it comes out of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it's documented in there. As a matter of fact, uh, our second president, uh, who Jefferson, who they said was a deist, you know, he, he bought 10,000 Bibles to be distributed when he was president, to be distributed in every public school and every government institution in the United States. The so-called via is the separation of church and state. If you look at Locke and the writings of Locke, even the way that we sit, when we sit in the House, we sit in the, the, in the uh, Congress, we sit in the semicircles, not the way the English did, facing each other. We sit the way that the Sanhedrin would sit. The Levites were not to be taxed because government can control the taxing. So the government was not to tax the church. The church, church was supposed to be separate. Locke well, quotes uh, King Uzziah. King Uzziah, who was blessed by God, he's the government, would always have the priest come to, to his court to give him advice, to console him, to give him understanding and wisdom and knowledge. He goes to the temple one time, because he's blessed by God, and he goes, I'm here to give my blessings. And they said, no, you, you, you can't. You're the government. You're not allowed in here. And he goes, well, I am the government. I'm the king, and I welcome you. And he does. And he struck down with leprosy. The separation of church and state that was designed by our founding fathers, and you may disagree with it, but you can't rewrite history, was designed to keep the government out of the church, not the church out of the government. It's our duty, it's our responsibility to be engaged, engaged in education. And what I want to make sure you, you do is right now with CRT training, We've had a lot of victories, as mentioned. We had some home runs. We really had some victories uh, on moving the state forward. But what my concern is, the mass mandates, the vaccine mandates, all those things that we've had victories on, they've motivated our side. The fact that the Virginia uh, governor, former governor, said that about parents not being involved, motivated the mothers to get out and vote. We can't rely on the other side doing bad things for us to be motivated. We have to be motivated anyway. We have to be motivated because we have children and grandchildren that are going to come up and be the next leaders. And so it's up to us always to be engaged, always to be motivated, and always to be active in that. And so what that means is, and I tell some of my business partners here that, that in Gainesville, uh, they don't get engaged in politics. And I said, it's, it, it's part of my business plan. We, we have a budget in my business to donate to candidates. Because we have to be involved. They're involved in our lives. They're involved in our businesses. So what I'd encourage you to do is just continue to do that. Uh, if you've got an opportunity on the other side, especially young people, engage them in a way that makes you not the enemy off the bat. That's not going to do it. You've got to understand. And I'll close with this on, on how we have to understand how people work and how biases work. I was at a student government class um, a couple of years ago. It was a 12th grade at a high school. And one of the questions they asked me is, how come there's all this polarization and bias and stuff? And I asked the class, I said, um, how many of you kids have an iPhone? And about three quarters of the class raised their hand. I said, but how many of you have an Android? The rest of them. So everybody has a phone, majority of them have iPhones, but a lot of people had Android phones. And I asked them, I said, so iPhone users, right now, the Android users are going to show you something that makes your phone better, cheaper, easier to operate, last longer, everything's going to be better. If they could prove that to you, would you switch? No. 
Android users. The iPhone users are going to show you why, why their phones are better, cheaper, longer lasting, less glitches, less problems. Android users, would you switch? So everybody in the class agreed they weren't going to switch. Now, we can't get caught up like the Democrats in the ideologues where they believe everything, but we've got to understand their, how they, how, how does Apple use that as a marketing tool? And we've got to understand the mind and we've got to understand who we're dealing with. We have people that we can explain logically sometimes what makes sense, and they don't get it because they're, they, well, and there's another part of that that we can uh, talk later about on, on a spiritual level. But we have an opportunity and an obligation to go for it, for us to be educated to start with, do our job, and do it for our kids, do it for our grandkids. Great. Thank you.